Welcome. Thank you for coming to From Tribe and Fire, this celebration in music and poetry of the students of the Safe House Education Fund. I greet you from the land of the coastal Miwok people in acknowledgement that as we give our voices, resources, and love to ending oppression and colonization of women's bodies in Kenya, many of us may be standing on land that was taken from indigenous peoples here in the US and beyond. We offer our gifts today in the prayer that we serve the transformation of these currents of oppression and colonization everywhere within us and around us. I welcome each of you to this gathering at the hearth, at the fire of poetry and music. And I especially welcome with gratitude unending the five poets and three musicians here with us today, Ellen, Marie, Naomi, Danusha, Jane, Jamie, Agu, and Mathoni Drummer Queen. And I welcome the members of the SHE team, Maya and Nikala, who you see here with me, whose generosity and very hard work makes all of this possible. I want to begin with the words of Walt Whitman, who many of us consider to be one of our bardic ancestors. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Never have I known the truth of these words more than in one afternoon in August, about 2007, when I had just arrived at a safe house in the midst of the Great Rift Valley in Narok, Kenya. I was standing on the mud floor of the kitchen area, surrounded by 50 teenage Maasai girls who had run away from female genital mutilation, early childhood marriage, and their tribe's refusal to educate females. They had run away from their families and their villages and the only life they'd ever known at the age of eight, nine, 12, 14, they'd braved walking for miles, hyenas, lions. They'd ridden on the back of a boy's bike or in the truck of what they called a good Samaritan. They were waiting for me to say something and I was frozen. All I could do was recite a poem. That poem broke us all open to the atom Walt Whitman is pointing to, the atom belonging to me, which as good belongs to you. In our tears, the seed of the Safe House Education Fund was planted. The right poem at the right moment will take us directly into the nucleus of that atom. I have known it and you have known it. I have known it to bring Sunnis and Shiites together, children and grandparents together. And in that moment, 50 Maasai teenagers and a flustered middle-aged middle-class white woman into the single song in which we recognize the tribe below tribe. And we hear the song in the center of our human experience that is always singing. This is what I feel when I hear the poetry of these poets gathered on the screen with me. And when I hear the music of Jamie and Agu and Mathoni Drummer Queen. We chose the Zoom meeting format rather than the webinar format so that we could feel each other as a community. And um, you can toggle between gallery view and speaker view uh, but we wanted to be able to look around the fire and see the kindred souls that have gathered here. We will have we have the chat on now and you are totally welcome to say hello from wherever you are. 
But in a moment, probably less than a minute, we're going to turn it off during the offerings from the artists, and then we'll turn it back on during the last few minutes of our being together. You are now muted. Um, you can't unmute yourself, but at the end, we're going to allow and invite everyone to unmute themselves so that we can herald the artists with our wild applause and appreciation. And most important, there will be a 45 or so minute gathering after this main program finishes for those who would like to know more about the She Fund. And I'll be playing a fantastic poem that the girls wrote with me that's about six minutes long that they wanted you to see on video. So each of the poets and musicians gathered here today has had a personal relationship with the She Fund and with me through the years. And I could talk about each of them forever, and I would like to. But I'm going to keep my introductions very short in order to make more time for their voices. You can read their bios in the program you were sent, and if you haven't gotten that program for one reason or another, you can find it at the link that is um, above my head, uh, which is where you went to enroll. Since the beginning of the She Fund, Ellen Bass has been a support to me personally as my friend and my teacher and also to the She students. It gives me faith in humanity whenever I see Ellen's poems in the New Yorker magazine or when I gather with a literally hundreds of students which in her Friday morning classes, which she calls the living room craft talks. I love that human beings love and hear deeply Ellen's poems. I am so grateful to welcome you, Ellen. Thank you, Kim, and everyone who's worked so hard to make this come together. Uh, it's just such a a joy to be here and support the She Fund and be with you all. I wanted to read um, a couple of poems that uh, are a, a bit about kindness. This first one is called Kiss. When Lynn saw the lizard floating in her mother-in-law's swimming pool, she jumped in. And when it wasn't breathing, its body limp as a baby drunk on milk, she laid it on her palm and pressed one fingertip to its silky breast with just about the force you need to test the ripeness of a peach, only quicker, a brisk little push with a bit of spring in it. Then she knelt dripping wet in her Doc Martens and camo t-shirt with the neck ripped out and bent her face to the lizard's face, her big plush lips to the small stiff jaw that she'd pried apart with her opposable thumb and she blew a tiny puff into the lizard's lungs. The sun glared against the turquoise water. What did it matter if she saved one lizard, one lizard more or less in the world? But she bestowed the kiss of life again and again until the lizard's wrinkled lids peeled back, its muscles roused its own first breath, and she set it on the hot cement where mm -hmm. it rested a moment before darting off. In the 70s and uh, late 60s, 70s, early 80s, I, I worked a lot with the survivors of child sexual abuse, adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And I've begun to write a little bit about my experience in that work. And I wanted to uh, share this and especially for the, the girls who um, are healing and um, those who fortunately have uh, escaped um, that abuse. And um, it's called Snow. And it's after a painting by Beverly Sky, 1989. She's put pearl essence in the paint, 
so the snow catches the light like snow. And because the pond is covered in snow and clouds streak above a copse of pine and fir, snow is swirling over everything. We walked out into that snow. Was it day or dusk? I can't tell from the mauve sky and the way snow lightens the air. I remember the air, cold and fresh as spring water. It quenched the roaring inside us. All day I'd listened to the women as they bared the memories incised on their bones, flecks of a stranger's saliva or a father's cloudy semen stabbed into their blood. All day the bruised child wove in and out of the circle, hobbled, hobbling, her body cracked like firewood, the halves falling away, the mind splitting. When the selves begin to speak, it's like words ripped out of the throat. But even with just these first freedoms, the heart revives and something essential rivers into the thinnest capillaries. Soon we will sit to fragrant soup and bread, but first we walk out and it seems the snow is falling upon the smoky remains of abandoned fires and some God who cares nothing for humans, for their young who emerge slimy from the womb, hungry and helpless, so crushable, even once they can hop on one foot or play the flute. This God though has an eye for beauty and lavishes it on these silver swirls of snow, the dark green breath of the trees and the pond iced over and the sky iced over and something gold flickering through the branches. I, I, I like to write um, poems that uh, praise things that are not usually praised and thinking a lot about our bodies um, and appreciation of the girl and woman body. Uh, this is called Ode to Fat. Tonight, as you undress, I watch your wondrous flesh that swelled again, the way a river swells when the ice relents. Sweet relief, just to regard the sheaves of your hips, your boundless breasts and marshy belly. I adore the acreage of your thighs, and praise the promising planets of your ass. Oh, you were lean that terrifying year you were unraveling, as though you were returning to the slender scrap of a girl I fell in love with. But your skin was vacant, a ripped sack, sugar spilling out and your bones insistent. Oh, praise the loyalty of the body that labors to rebuild its palatial realm Bless butter, bless brie, sanctify schmaltz and cream and cashews, stoke the furnace of the stomach and load the vessels. Darling, drench yourself in opulent oil, the lamp of your body glowing. May you always flourish enormous and sumptuous, be marbled with fat, a great vault that I can enter, the cathedral where I pray. And uh, I'll end with this poem, How to Apologize. How to Apologize. Cook a large fish. Choose one with many bones. A skeleton you will need skill to expose. Maybe the flying silver carp that's invaded the Great Lakes, tumbling the others into oblivion. If you don't live near a lake, you'll have to travel. Walking is best and shows you mean it, but you could take a train and let yourself be soothed by the rocking on the rails. It's permitted to receive solace for whatever you did or didn't do. Pitiful, beautiful human. When my mother was in the hospital, my daughter and I had to clear out the home she wouldn't return to. Then she recovered and asked, incredulous, how could you have thrown out all my shoes? 
so you'll need a boat. You could rent or buy, but for the sake of repairing the world, build your own. Thin strips of Western red cedar are perfect, but don't cut a tree. There'll be a demolished barn or downed trunk if you venture further. And someone will have a mill and someone will loan you tools. The perfume of sawdust and the curls that fall from your plane will sweeten the hours. Each night, we dream 36 billion dreams. In one night, we could dream back everything lost. So grill the pale flesh, unharness yourself from your weary stories, then carry the oily, succulent fish to the one you hurt. There is much to fear as a creature caught in time, but this is safe. You need no defense. This is just another way to know you are alive. Thank you. Wow. In one night, we could dream back everything that has been lost. Thank you, Ellen. I first met Danusha Lamaris when she came to a workshop I was giving with Jamie Sieber in Santa Cruz. I did not know at the time that I was in the presence of a woman who would write some of the poems that would most deeply touch my life, but I knew I was in the presence of a magnificent gift. It was only later that I realized she was also the daughter of a woman who has been an inspiration to me in my work in Africa, Natasha Martin. Natasha ran an organization in Kenya called Grace USA, supporting the education of AIDS orphans. She passed away just about a year ago in July, 2020. Although I didn't know her well, I treasure the few times we got together to share our love of poetry and Kenya. The last time I saw Natasha, she was with Danusha at the last She Poetry Reading in February of 2020, and a lot of you were probably there too, just before the pandemic lockdown began. As I welcome and thank Danusha for gracing us with her poems today, I thank her also for the title of our event, and I send out a prayer of thanks to her mother, Natasha, too. Thank you so much, Kim. It's just so moving to be here with you and with the beautiful work that the She Fund is doing. So thank you for including me. My heart is so full mm -hmm. right now. I just, aren't we blessed to get to connect in these ways even during this strange time? So thank you all who are here with us attending for being in my living room with me and having some story time. I, that's how I felt when Ellen was reading. I felt like I could just listen to this all day. So thank you. And I, I wanna say this past year, I have started talking to myself quite a bit out loud um, in the absence, I guess, of as much human interaction. So I, I hear myself reassuring myself or saying, you know, what do you want for breakfast? Or are you okay? And so I have this sort of new relationship um, <laughs> of to, with self-address. And I think that this first poem and many, many of the poems come from this place of wanting to ask myself, are you okay right now in a year when it's not particularly easy to be a human being? Um, so thanks for letting me share it. So I'll start with a small poem called The Heart Is Not. The heart is not a pocket, a thing that can be turned inside out by anybody's hand, not a place for pebbles or loose change, not to carry old receipts. It does not tear at the seam. It does not have a seam. It cannot be torn. And 
this next poem is called Regret with the R in parentheses, so it can be read regret or egret. And um, it's reconnected to the fact that I'm a bit dyslexic. So when I read headlines or words, they're often very interesting for a moment. And then I realize, oh no, it said something else entirely. But this came from that. And also because isn't life just full of both egrets, at least where I live, and regrets often, though I try not to hold those. Regret. I see the word egret, but read instead regret. A trick of the mind, its reversals. One, a white slash rising from the marsh. The other, a stone strapped to the heart the way I've carried all the would haves, all the ifs, each alternate exhausts. The egret wades in the dark water seeking fish, the heart, constancy. I doubt the egret has regrets, hatch, fledge, breed, hunt, and besides, a lovely name that comes from French, aigrette for brush, after the long feathers that stream down its back. How do its legs, bent reversed, move ahead? Who wouldn't want to walk like that? There are days I step outside my body, arise, fly over the field of my life and glimpse, not error, but river, rock, and oak, a wide expanse. Here and there a meadow, dry grass dotted with, could they be poppies? Some bright blurred orange flame. And this poem uh, comes from a line I read in the Linda Hogan's beautiful book of nature writing called Dwellings. So if you haven't read it, that's another treat possibly in store for you. Her deep conversation with the world that takes place in that book and in her new one, The Radiant Lives of Animals, is really worth attending to. Um, I think so much about the overstory of everything that we read in the news and all the devastation that is going on and how underneath it is this understory of connection uh, that Naomi was talking about earlier today, just that the ways in which we're connected and that good things are happening as we attend to each other in the world. And anyway, that's some of the thinking under this. Nothing wants to suffer after Linda Hogan. Nothing wants to suffer, not the wind as it scrapes itself against the cliff, not the cliff being eaten slowly by the sea. The earth does not want to suffer the rough tread of those who do not notice it. The trees do not want to suffer the ax nor see their sisters felled by root rot, mildew, rust. The coyote in its den, the puma stalking its, its prey. These too want ease and a tender animal in the mouth to take their hunger. An offering one hopes made quickly and without much suffering. The chair mourns an angry sitter. The lamp, a scalded moth. A table, the weight of years of argument. We know this, though we forget. Not the shark, nor the tiger, fanged as they are, nor the worm, content in its windowless world of soil and stone, not the stone resting in its riverbed, the riverbed gazing up at the stars, least of all the stars, ensconced in their canopy, 
looking down at all of us, their offspring, scattered so far beyond reach. And I'll read just one more here to close uh, that I thought I should read because it has the words from tribe and fire in it. So I will read small kindnesses. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by or how strangers still say bless you when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it to smile at them and for them to smile back. For the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire. Only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy. These fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danusha. You know, when I think about your poems, I think, wow, that's so original. But then if I go a little deeper into whatever the thought is, I realize it's just the truth. It's just the truth that these are our moments of tribe and our moments of fire. Thank you. Mm. So as we were preparing for this event, I reached out to three of the SHE students and I asked them to create a one minute selfie video on their phone, speaking about what it was most important to them about the SHE fund. Luckily, Lena didn't understand. And she hired a group of her friends who are film students and they came up with a glorious 20 minute video. And I'm not going to play all 20 minutes of it for you here, but we hope to have it up on the website at some point. Um, but I've made three, two to three minute excerpts of it, which we will play interspersed throughout this event. Um, because I think Lena tells you more about the heart and soul of the She Fund than I ever could. So here's the first installment and the other two will happen later in the program. My name is Lina Naisho, a beneficiary of SHE, uh, studying at Masimara University. I'm coming from a village called Nchaishi at Majimoto Ward, Narok County. A lady, a Maasai lady with great ambition and great dreams. I have big dreams of the Ma girls and, come and giving back to my community. In my community, girls are being looked down upon than boys. Boys have greater privileges than, than girls. Girls go through early marriages, FGM, they drop out of school because of the hardship and big difficulties in the, in the village. My life is a story, a big story. I grew up in a village where girls are being, uh, going through difficult times. My life was so difficult because even the, the distance that I go to school, I go 16 kilometers a day. So it was so hard because the weather was just harsh. We don't have sweaters, warm clothes, we don't have shoes. So I just walk that 
long distance and the animals are there. I met with the lions and other, other uh, wild animals. But I thank God because all through, from class two to class six, I have been walking all those distances, but I didn't lose hope. I was um, at the safe house the day she arrived. And um, she's such a precious, precious human being. And she's also an assistant in the office. She's in school now, but she's also an assistant in the office in Kenya. Um, I'm sorry about that buzz. I don't know where it came from, but hopefully it will go away with as much mystery as that with which it came. Um, as I was contemplating the few sentences I might choose to introduce Jane Hirschfield, I went back over all of our emails since I first reached out to her for permission to speak her astoundingly beautiful translation of the Gnostic gospel entitled The Thunder, Perfect Mind. I was moved to tears actually at the quiet intimacy of the conversation that instantly arose in those emails between us that wends its way from June of 2005 until today. I have reached out frequently to Jane through the years for permission to speak some of her poems, for support for my book, to participate in all of the She Fund readings. And she has always given far, far more than I've requested. My gratitude is huge, Jane, for who, who you are, for the way you live on this planet, and for all the forms of your support for the She Fund. Thank you for joining us now here. Well, thank you so much, Kim, for giving me the chance to help in such a particular and magnificent way that I would never have been able to do without you and the entire team that makes She Fund possible and the girls themselves. And I'm going to begin with a poem that I have read at a prior benefit, but I wanted to read today because I think this is the first time that there is the chance that some of the girls themselves and their family and their community and others from all over the world might be listening. And so this seemed an appropriate poem to choose. The poet. She is working now in a room not unlike this one, the one where I write or you read. Her table is covered with paper. The light of the lamp would be tempered by a shade where the bulb's single harshness might dissolve. But it is not. She has taken it off. Her poems, I will never know them, though they are the ones I most need. Even the alphabet she writes in I may not decipher. Her chair, let us imagine whether it is leather or canvas, vinyl, or wicker, let her have a chair, her shadeless lamp, the table. Let one or two she loves be in the next room. Let the door be closed, the sleeping ones healthy. Let her have time and silence, enough paper to make mistakes and go on. So we can imagine and understand all the poets all over the world whose work we ourselves might never meet, but which changes the mutual air that we breathe every day. This has been such a hard period of time. Maybe all periods of time are hard, but this last stretch, long stretch has been difficult. And so I thought I would read you a few poems that emerge and navigate from the idea of how do we meet the difficult? Each moment a white bull steps shining into the world. If the gods bring to you a strange and frightening creature, accept the gift as if it were one you had chosen. 
say the accustomed prayers, oil the hooves well, caress the small ears with praise. Have the new halter of woven silver embedded with jewels. Spare no expense. Pay what is asked when a gift arrives from the sea. Treat it as you yourself would be treated, brought speechless and naked into the court of a king. And when the request finally comes, do not hesitate even an instant. Stroke the white throat, the heavy trembling dewlaps you'd come to believe were yours and plunge in the knife. Not once did you enter the pasture without pause, without yourself trembling, that you came to love it, that was the gift. Let the envious gods take back what they can. This next poem, also a poem of navigating the difficult. The weighing. The heart's reasons seen clearly, even the hardest will carry its whip marks and sadness and must be forgiven. As the drought starved Eland forgives the drought starved lion who finally takes her, enters willingly then the life she cannot refuse and is lion, is fed and does not remember the other. So few grains of happiness measured against all the dark and still the scales balance. The world asks of us only the strength we have and we give it. Then it asks more and we give it. This past period of difficulty has included not only a global pandemic, but also the ongoing, seemingly endless um, sufferings of uh, social injustice, of our not seeing one another as part of one whole. And I wanted to read this next poem. It covers a lot of ground. It's got the International Space Station in it. It's got the formation of land in Florida. Uh, it's got evolution and the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs. It also has uh, the Syrian civil war, um, terrorism, and the crisis of refugees in the Mediterranean, which was going on for years when I came to write this poem, and now years later continues. Day beginning with seeing the International Space Station and a full moon over the Gulf of Mexico, and all its invisible fishes. None of this had to happen. Not Florida, not the ibis's beak, not water. Not the horseshoe crab's empty body and not the living starfish. Evolution might have turned left at the corner and gone down another street entirely. The asteroid might have missed. The seams of limestone need not have been susceptible to sand and mangroves. The radio might have found a different music. The hips of one man and the hips of another might have stood beside each other on a bus in Aleppo and recognized themselves as long lost brothers. The key could have broken off in the lock and the nail can refused its lid. I might have been the fish the brown pelican swallowed. You might have been the way the moon kept not setting long after we thought it would, long after the sun was catching inside the low wave curls coming in at a certain angle. The light might not have been eaten again by its moving. If the unbearable were not weightless, we might yet buckle under the grief of what hasn't changed yet. Across the world, a man pulls a woman from the water from which the leapt from overfilled boat has entirely vanished. From the water pulls one child, another. Both are living and both will continue to live. This did not have to happen. No part of this had to happen.
I am going to read you some very short poems. I'm quite fond of very short poems. Uh, this is one of uh, persistence. Obstacle. This body still walking. The wind must go around it. Opening the hands between here and here. On the dark road, only the weight of the rope, yet the horse is there. I sat in the sun. I sat in the sun. I moved my chair into sun, the way hunger is moved when called fasting. And I am going to end with a poem of beginning again, because the great blessing of our lives is so long as we are alive, there is always that chance to reemerge. Possibility is one of the abiding graces of existence. Uh, the title da capo comes from music. It's an Italian phrase that appears at the end of a piece of music and is the instruction to go back and play it again from the start. Da capo. Take the used up heart like a pebble and throw it far out. Soon there is nothing left. Soon the last ripple exhausts itself in the weeds. Returning home. Slice carrots, onions, celery. Glaze them in oil before adding the lentils, water, and herbs. Then the roasted chestnuts, a little pepper, the salt. Finish with goat cheese and parsley. Eat. You may do this, I tell you. It is permitted. Begin again the story of your life. Mm, thank you, Jane. Uh, I'm so moved. I can't talk. Sometimes I want to run around behind you like um, Hussam ran around behind Rumi, writing down not just the poems, but everything you say. You just said, which I wrote down, possibility is one of the abiding graces of existence. Possibility is one of the abiding graces of existence. Thank you for all your words, including those. I have had the great blessing of working and playing with Jamie Sieber since 2001. 20 years. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> she has been my artistic collaborator, friend, and one of the greatest sources of sanity in my life. <laughs> In 2015, she and Agu produced their collaborative recording, Reach In, which for me has become one of the soundtracks I play almost every day. I just taught Alexa to play it as an alarm clock for me, so I wake up into sanity. This is what I wrote the first time I heard it. Suddenly, in the midst of Agu's bowls and Jamie's bow, I remembered tenderness and time and breathing and friendship and voluptuous space between doings and caring and generosity and waking up from the nightmare. It is as if the vibrations of bowl and cello create an architecture and the true offering is the space inside it. Thank you for the gentle and fierce infusion of this blessing, this remembering. Thank you for being with us, Jamie and Agu. Thank you, Kim. Thank I'd like you. to thank you, Kim, also for giving us the opportunity to be here. And I want to also thank Jane Hirschfeld for reminding me of why I wake up every morning to just begin again and know that I too can um, just propagate beauty if I can't think of anything else. I can propagate beauty. And Jamie reminds me of this every day. 
Thank you. Oh, sure. And can you hear the thumping bass line out of our, out of our kitchen? It's a neighbor somewhere. Um, thank you. Uh, what an honor to share this time together from our kitchen in Seattle. And what an honor to share the dreams of the girls and the young women of Kenya. Um, truly, taking this in deep. So thank you to all the poets. Thank you, Kim, and to all of the organizers of the She Fund. And we're just going to play two pieces woven together. Um, so invite yourself. We invite you to just go on a journey.
Thank you. Thank you, Jamie and Agu. It's incredibly powerful to experience your music as live as possible today. Hi everyone, my name is Maya Brown. I am the Associate Director at the SHE Fund. And it is an absolute honor to be with you all today. Thank you to all of the artists who are sharing your gifts with us. And thank you to Kim and Nicola, my colleagues in the SHE Fund who have made today possible. I wanna take a moment to express endless gratitude to all of you who are here today and especially to all who have donated to the SHE Fund as part of your attendance today. I'm very excited to share that as of the beginning of this event, we had a last minute donation that pushed us over the edge into having raised $16,000 for the SHE students. It is an incredible gift that you all are participating in giving to the SHE students. That money will directly support not only their college education, but also their living expenses, a roof over their head, food, clothes, books, everything the students need to pursue their education and make their dreams come true. My personal goal for today's event is to try to raise $20,000. If we're able to raise $20,000 together, we would be able to fund a year of college for seven students. That is a life-changing amount of money for these students. If you are not in a position to give financially, please know that your presence and the gifts of the energy you send to the students are welcomed with gratitude. If you are in a position to donate and you haven't already, or even if you have and you're extra moved by today's event to donate more, we welcome your gifts. And if we are able to raise $4,000 more together today, we will be transforming the lives of seven students. So whatever you're able to give, whether it's your money, your energy, your presence, we welcome you and we express our gratitude. I'm now thrilled to turn our stage back over to Lena for part two of her incredible story. And I thank you all for being here. When I, I, I was growing up, uh, the time came when I was to go through FGM. It was 2006, uh, August when we were to go through the cut, which is FGM. So when the time came, I was so, so down. I knew that my dream will be, uh, will be cut off. I know my education will be cut off. Everything will be shattered. So when, uh, when time came for us to go through the cut, I was so disturbed. I was so sad. So with God's help, I was rescued and I was taken to Tassaro Rescue Center at town. Tassaro Rescue Center helped me to go through primary and secondary school. So I, I have been there for all those years from class six to form four. So after after uh, from four, which is uh, after secondary education, before uh, she came in, I stayed at home for three years, uh, for two years, which is 2013 and 2014. I had nobody to 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 help me go through my my university education. I almost lost hope because nobody will, will help me even to buy clothes, even to buy food. I'm just there. So with God's grace, we met with, we met with Kim Rosen, who is the founder of She Student, She, she Fan. 
and I thank God because at that time he just met with her when I was almost losing hope, totally losing hope. But I thank God because of she. She came to me, she came in, and I saw that my dreams are coming. Sorry about that. Um, she said, I saw that my dreams are coming alive again. <laughs> Sorry about the uh, sudden interruption. Um, yeah, thank you, Maya, for that um, beautiful ask. I don't know anyone who asks more gracefully than you. And um, thank you, Lena, for the second installment of her story. On December 11th, 2008, I discovered that Bernard Madoff had stolen my life's savings and that of a close friend as well. In shock, we both determined that the only sane thing to do was to learn Naomi Shihab Nye's poem, Kindness, by heart. We stayed together in her house for three days during which we spoke the poem over and over to each other, calming and deepening our frightened hearts. Whether it was the spell of the poem or the extremity of our situation, the kindness started streaming in. Ironically, the story of the, th the theft and the poetic medicine of Naomi's poem that saved me made its way into my book, saved by a poem, and it became the hook that the media seized on, and it even got us featured in the New Yorker magazine. And that is how Naomi, whose phone started ringing at the publication of the article, found me. Since then, our lives have weaved in miraculous ways, and her presence here today is one of the greatest gifts. Thank you so much for being with us, Naomi. Oh, thank you so much, dear Kim, and thank you to everyone who works for the SHE Fund to improve so many lives, so many beautiful lives. I just wish everyone in the world who is suffering today from terror, anxiety, grief, could be listening to that music. Thank you, great musicians, for the gift you have given us. And my sister poets, you are raising me up today through your voices. Thank you all for the work you do. And I wanted to share with you a quote about education I heard yesterday in a Palestinian film called They Were Nomads. Education is like entering a dark place with a lantern. A dark place with a lantern. Thank you for carrying so many lanterns into so many lives. Propriety. How dare they, they, they say, say, say anything we can or cannot do with our own red and blue. We are voting for ourselves, unbound by convention, your convention. I refuse to go to the convention. Too many people. We will kiss in the hotel hallway. If we please, you and me, New York City on the last day of an old year, in future, any time, exit door to hotel stairway appears. Feel a sizzle, swizzle stick of memory spinning me through so much dullness, red and blue. Across the sea, a girl in Gaza speaks into a table microphone. Do you believe in infinity? If so, what does it look like to you? Not like a wall, not like a soldier with a gun, not like a ruined house bombed out of being, not like concrete wreckage of a school's good hope, a clinic's best dream. In fact, not like anything imposed upon you and your family thus far in your precious 13 years. 
My infinity would be the never ending light you deserve. Every road opening up in front of you. Soberly, she nods her head. In our time, voices cross the sea easily, but sense is still difficult to come by. Next girl's question. Were you ever shy? I am so moved by Lena's story and um, all the girls in your project. And I'm reading a few poems, thinking of them in particular, coming into education out of childhoods and all the difficulty and the labor of so many childhoods in the world. So I'm reading from a book of poems for girls called Amaze Me. Every day, my hundred year old next door neighbor told me, every day is a good day if you have it. I had to think about that a minute. She said, every day is a present someone left at your birthday place at the table. Trust me, it may not feel like that, but it's true. When you're my age, you'll know. 12 is a treasure. And it's up to you to unwrap the package gently, lift out the gleaming hours wrapped in tissue. Don't miss the bottom of the box. If the shoe doesn't fit, you take it off. Of course you take it off. It doesn't worry you. It isn't your shoe. I want to meet the girl who does not run her country the way I do not run my country. I want to meet the girl who hides in a crowd, who laughs into her hand, who was not in the picture. The girl who stands back after being introduced by her parents in a way she would not choose, who turns her head to the side so she doesn't miss seeing what's there. Where is she? I think she's in the She Project. And I'll close with a couple from The Tiny Journalist, which is a book um, in honor of young activists, Jenna Jihad Ayad Tamimi, and uh, all the young girls in Gaza who work hard in so many projects. Please look up the project also called We Are Not Numbers. Each day we are given so many gifts. I did it. I made friends with a fly. Yawn a little pause, relighting breath. Blink a break from sun's sharp gaze. Yesterday evening, after rain, the world tiled rosy. Such a brief slip of minutes, as if someone got her wish. We could live in pink, hold a shining note, release someone else's anger. Gratitude list. Thank you for insulting me. You helped me see how much I was worth. Thank you for overlooking my humanity. In that moment, I gained power. To be forgotten by the wider world and the righteous religious and the weaponized soldiers is not the worst thing. It gives you time to discover yourself. Lemons, mint, almonds roasted and salted, almonds raw, pistachios roasted and salted, cheese. And I'll close with positivism for all the positive energy you share, Kim Rosen, and everyone around you. My friend in Gaza writes to me, Gaza Strip is really so wonderful, regardless of any siege. The seaport, the green fields, peaceful roads decorated with red, pink, white, orange flowering trees, decent people, elegant little restaurants, hotels with fascinating views. We wish 
the crossing borders are always open where we can travel freely and friends can come to visit freely as well. Fresh as a new notebook. That's how anyone wanted to live. Hopeful as a pencil sharpened, clear as one beam of light landing on the table's far side. The children dove into a story and flew far away. Even those who had never been to an airport or seen a plane land at close range. This was our superpower, retaining imagination in worst days. They smiled shyly. They expressed no blame. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Naomi. I feel so much love as I listen to you. It almost doesn't matter the poem. It just, it's some kind of attractant for the love inside me. So I thank you so, so much. Each year when I go to Kenya, Annie Lightbody, who is the um, student liaison, and also um, I call her my goddaughter because I've known her since she was, before she was born, although technically she's not. We both go and spend about a week and a half living with the girls at the safe house and working with them on the performance of a poem which they will perform for One Billion Rising, the worldwide initiative to stop violence against women and girls, as well as various girls empowerment ceremonies in Kenya. This is also a way for me to get to know each girl at the rescue center so that by the time she graduates high school and wants to join the SHE Fund, I know who she is and I have nurtured a personal relationship with her. In 2019, which was actually the last time I got to go to Kenya because of the pandemic, I came across the work of a Kenyan hip hop artist named Mathoni Drummer Queen through a wonderful movie, which I totally recommend called Rafiki. It's about a homosexual relationship in Kenya where it's against the law. I became a huge fan of Mathoni's and I reached out to her to get permission to work with the girls at the safe house on one of her spoken word pieces called Dear Matilde. She was so thrilled for us to perform the poem and so supportive of our work that I asked her to lend her voice to this initiative. And she made this passionate video for us since the time difference made it impossible for her to be with us in person. I am so happy to have the voice of this Kenyan artist infusing us with her rhythms and life force, as well as a bit of Swahili in the lyrics. So put on your dancing shoes as we welcome Mithoni Drummer Queen. My name is Mithoni Drummer Queen. I'm so happy to be here, to be contributing to this amazing fundraiser. Me and my friend Tugi, we're here to bring you some vibes, to lift your spirits. This is our contribution. We're so grateful for the opportunity. His vibes, first things first. Call up the mortuary, tell them on this track, murder of the century. And for my kindness, I'll pay for the obituary. Sorry for the mess, I do this too habitually. Second up, I propose a toast. Raise your glass high from Nairobi to coast. I don't need to brag, I don't wanna boss, but I will cut you down for acting like a toaster. Ti heo na ingia kwenye club na kadem kababi kama stand kasa fika na ito fulani ni nusumulami. Yole ma begani unadani eti pamba sita yali yamani. I didn't know eti yuko funny for wasting your time, baby. Pola sama hane. I thought I told you never be your honey. It's irrelevant to me about your car, you crib your money. This not me playing hard to get. This me saying that I'm hard to get. It's in my blood running blue through my veins royal. Media, tell them how I do super royal. And to be clear, I don't deal with potential. You wanna step to me? You better have credentials. Like so special, so special, so special. Is a weapon of mass violence. 
violence. Operating with a 007 license. Well, like getting all your chitter chatter job a nonsense. Let's be clear who they really fear. Who rock a party hard from the front to the rear? It's the drama mama on a clap banger. And you are to dry like clots on a hang at the hell nine gear. When you boost like a gold, when you tooth, not today, makina roof. At India, what you suit? Pack a owner's in my light. At India, what they like? Come on, Lawi. At India, you will fly your money. I didn't know all your week. Wouldn't sound better if we all give a week to you. True, safe and better things to do. Step aside, sun really, I mean, I'm through. All my singers in the buffalo choir. All my people strumming on the egg guitar wire. Share a table dashboard, drummers on fire. Make a trumpet harmonies on the head briars. It's a felony. How to make the sweet, sweet melodies. Bring the beat back in. work that you're doing. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. You can find my music on Spotify, on Apple Music, on Deezer, on YouTube, Amazon. The name is Mudhani Drummer Queen. Wow. I am definitely feeling it after that. And I know that you are too. My name is Nicola Jandai, and I'm the Program and Operations Director at the SHE Fund. So thankful for Mathoni Drummer Queen for her beautiful contribution and her good vibes. I'm so delighted to share this time with all of you today. I have gotten the warmest, warmest welcome from Kim and Maya as I've entered the team. It's been wonderful to get to know the community. There have been many of you that have welcomed me as well. Thank you to the artists. This is amazing. I am also amazed to announce that we are at almost $21,000. I think that was maybe 15 minutes ago that Maya made that announcement. That is incredible. We are so, so grateful for your love, for your compassion, for your generosity. That is unbelievable. If we can get to 24,000, we can fund eight girls. Who will accept this challenge? I would love to see that number keep growing until the end of this event. The fact that we did that in 15 or 20 minutes is unbelievable and inspiring to me. So every $3,000 is another student. We'll be doing a check again at the end of this event. Please accept this challenge. And if you cannot, donate monetarily. Again, your presence, your energy, your support, your kindness, spreading the word about this work in our organization is just as important. We are truly in awe of your support today. Thank you so much. We are about to hear the final segment of Lena Naisho's powerful video about the impact of the SHE Fund in her life in Kenya. When she came into my life, I saw that my dreams of becoming a better woman, a powerful woman in the community, a, a woman that come and transform the girls in our community, even in the nation. Now I, I can see dreams coming and coming and coming. Because she, the amazing thing to she, they provided to us that key of a brighter future to a Maasai lady.
to a Maasai lady like me and other she students. Education is the key of everything. Education is the key of a brighter future. Education is the key of having a healthy life. Education is a key of even of eradicating poverty, eradicating even this incurring and circulation of retrogressive cultures of Maasai practices, like early marriages, female genital mutilation, FGM, that girls are every year, every year, every year they are going through. And many and thousand girls in our, in our communities are just, their dreams are just cut off. So she gave, uh, gave me that they pay all my school fees. Imagine paying all my, the school fees of the uh, university. Now I'm in Masaimara University, taking uh, a degree in Bachelor of Commerce. I am now in that year, looking forward to finish next year, God willing, after this pandemic, uh, COVID-19 has gone. Because through that education, I can give that back to my community. I can come back and give girls hope that it doesn't matter where you come from, your dreams are still valid. I have a dream, and a dream to transform, to transform the life of girls in our community. A dream that I will make girls to know the importance of education. A dream to fight against these retrogressive practices in our community, like FGM and early marriages. After I have now finished my studies, I'll come back to my community and stand for the girls. My message to the donors out there, you are just doing a great thing. You cannot even imagine how your money is transforming our lives. Thank you so much to she. You are just amazing. To all people working with she, you are just doing an amazing job. Thank you. God bless you all. I love you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Oh boy, I am so blown away. I am so blown away. And uh, Maya, I don't have the exact number, but it's, it's crazy the, the influx of generosity that's coming towards us. Um, I think it's almost to 23,000 right now. So I am just at your feet in gratitude. As some of you know, who have been with us in the previous live poetry events, it is truly thanks to Marie Howe that I'm here today. Not only has Marie been my teacher, my inspiration and my friend in poetry, it was with her and her then seven-year-old daughter that I first went to Kenya. Had she not reached out her hand to welcome my companionship on that trip, I don't think I'd ever have had the courage to step so very far out of my own comfort zone. And as I wrote this, in fact, I think that's what I cherish in each of Marie's poems, that hand reaching out to summon me past my comfort zone into a fiercer immediacy, intimacy, and honesty with myself and the world around me. I am so grateful, Marie. Thank you.
for being with us. Um, well, Kim, first of all, just hello to everybody. It's wonderful that you're all here. Um, it's so good to be together. I, I'm so grateful to be with my sister poets um, and to thank everybody at the She Fund staff for doing what you do. Um, Kim, it's so good to see Kenya in these videos. Um, one day we have to take 20 minutes and just tell some of our stories from that trip. <laughs> because it was so much fun and it was so uh, changed it changed our life our life uh, my life and my daughter's life um, and to see these beautiful girls and um, to know uh, how difficult it was to get to that safe house for you the first time you went um, in that jeep through the night and the jungle um, extraordinary how we're all connected uh, okay, so I'm, I'm feeling I'm very overwhelmed too. Um, uh, I'm going to read just three poems. Um, the pandemic, it seems, has been here to teach us a great deal. Um, certainly, it's here to teach the so-called Western world something um, important about how we've been living. Um, these compartmentalized lives as if we're not touched by everything that touches everyone else. Um, during, I was, I live in New York City um, most of the time and um, New York City during the lockdown was, as anyone who was there knows, like many cities was extraordinary. Um, it was silent. The streets were empty. Um, day after day, all we heard was bird song and sirens. Um, sirens, silence, and bird song. Um, and sometime during the pandemic, that pandemic, that deep lockdown time, um, this, this poem um, came to me. It's, it's, let me just try and scroll up to it. It's called um, What the Silence Said. Um, and it seemed as if it was the silence itself talking um, to me, certainly, but to those of us who, who think we can think our way out of everything. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the silence means, but this is what it said. Pandemic, what the silence said. Do you still believe in borders now? Birds soar over your maps and walls and always have. You might have watched how the smoke from your own fires traveled on wind you couldn't see, wafting over the valley and up and over the hill and over the next valley and the next hill. Did you not hear the animals howl and sing? or hear the silence of the animals no longer singing. Now you know what it is to be afraid. Do you feel your senses sharpen? You think this is a dream? It is not a dream. You think this is a theoretical question? What do you love more than what you imagine is your singular life? The water grows clearer. The swans settle and float there. Are you willing to take your place in the forest again? To become loam and bark? To be a leaf falling from a great height? To be the worm who eats the leaf? and the bird who eats the worm. Look at the sky. Are you willing to become the sky again? You think this lesson is too hard for you. You want the time out to end. You want to go to the movies to sit and eat with your friends. It can end now, but not in the way you imagine. You know the mind that has been talking to you for so long the mind that can explain everything? 
don't listen. You were once a country. You were once a citizen of the country called I don't know. Remember the burning boat that brought you there? Climb in. And uh, here's a shout out to my sister Danusha uh, because the next poem I'm gonna read is by Linda Hogan. Um, I've been carrying this poem around with me. Um, Linda Hogan is a po poet, storyteller, academic, playwright, novelist, environmentalist, writer of stories. And she is currently the Chickasaw Nation's writer in residence. Um, and here's the poem I've been carrying around, map. This is the world so vast and lonely without end, with mountains named for men who brought hunger from other lands and fear of the thick, dark forest of trees that held each other up. Knowing fire dreamed of swallowing them and spoke an older tongue and the tongue of the nation of wolves was the wind around them. Even ice was not silent. It cried its broken self back to warmth, but they called it ice, wolf, forest of sticks, as if words would make it something they could hold in gloved hands, open, plot away and follow. This is the map of the forsaken world. This is the world without end, where forests have been cut away from their trees. These are the lines wolves could not pass over. This is what I know from science, that a grain of dust dwells at the center of every flake of snow, that ice can have its way with land, that wolves live inside a circle of their own beginning. This is what I know from blood. The first language is not our own. There are names each thing has for itself. And beneath us, the other order already moves. It is burning. It is dreaming. It is waking up. And this next poem goes out to Stephen Hawking, the great, the great scientist who wrote a book I couldn't understand, but I tried to. And, um, and I began to believe in the Big Bang theory um, that everything that is, everything, all the stars and all, this, all the gorgeous particulars every poet has been singing about today, um, you know, the wasp and the weasel and the wolf and the butterfly and us um, all came from one very condensed piece of matter smaller than the, the nail of our own thumb. And that that exploded at a certain moment in time. And with that explosion, the universe became itself. That original piece of matter, that original uh, thing before there were things, though, though it wasn't really a thing, is called the singularity. And this poem is called The Singularity and it's after reading Stephen Hawking. And this will be the last poem I'll read. Do you sometimes want to wake up to the singularity we once were. So compact, nobody needed a bed or food or money. Nobody hiding in the school bathroom or home alone, pulling open the drawer where the pills are kept. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, remember? 
There was no nature, no them, no tests to determine if the elephant grieves her calf or if the coral reef feels pain. Trashed oceans don't speak English or Farsi or French. Would that we could wake up to what we were when we were ocean and before that to when sky was earth and animal was energy and rock was liquid and stars were space and space was not at all, nothing. Before we came to believe humans were so important, before this awful loneliness, can molecules recall it? What once was before anything happened? No I, no we, no one, no was, no verb, no noun, only a tiny, tiny dot brimming with is, 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 all, everything, home. I'm, I'm, I'm just exquisitely blown open. Thank you, Marie. Those poems are just miracles. Um, and I love this last poem because it brings me back to where we began with Walt Whitman's every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Yeah, so we've now made it possible for everyone to unmute yourselves and I want to take just a minute and then Maya or Nicola will mute everyone but I want to take every just a minute to invite everyone to put your visuals on gallery view and to unmute yourself if you're willing to and to just give applause gratitude voice whatever to our poets and musicians. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A thousand thanks. You do have to unmute yourself for us to hear it, but we can see it. We can scroll through the, the screens and just thank you, thank you, thank you. Howl, weep, celebrate, laugh. We're so grateful. We're so grateful to all of you. Each of your, each of your gifts is a complete, um, uh, a, a wonder of the earth. One of the one of the wonders of the earth. So we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Um, we are going to follow this with um, a, an informal, semi-informal gathering about the SHE Fund. But for now, I want to thank all of you who have donated. We reached and went beyond our 20. We reached and went beyond our 20. I'm getting. Can, can you mute everybody, Maya? Can you mute everybody, Maya? <laughs> Um, and just to say the, uh, the chat is now open. If you'd like to write notes, we'll send, we'll send your notes off to all the artists. If you'd like to write a note, we'll send it to them afterwards. And um, uh, we'll have a meeting and I'll do, um, I'll share a poem from the girls at the safe house and um, a few more pieces of information about the SHE Fund. But for now, I wanna thank Maya and Nicola for your incredible shining presences that have also juggled the, uh, the what they call the back end. Um, and I wanna give one more heartful shout out to our artists and to all of you and to this most incredibly, incredible incredible successful fundraising that has allowed us to fund at least eight students um, and beyond. So you are awesome. Um, if you, you will get an email from us probably within a day or two, it will have an actual clickable link 
where you can uh, send donations if you couldn't work it out to do it here now. And for now, I want to officially say goodbye to any who are leaving us at this juncture. And um, I'll just wait a few minutes until those who would like to leave have left. And then I will uh, share a little bit more about the SHE Fund and we'll open it up for um, questions also. I am so grateful. I wish I could hug all of you. Um, and I know that will happen. Anon, it feels like it's happening right now. <laughs> So thank you all who have chosen to stay. Um, I wanna begin with a poem that, that the She Fund students and I wrote together that they performed a couple of years ago. Um, and it really tells their story in a beautiful way. And so I'm gonna let them tell their story about how they ended up at the safe house. Uh, let me see why this is not. There it is. Great. We are the girls who are changing history. We are the girls who demand equality. We say no, we are the current to go. We save our lives, we are changing our tribe. We are educated women and we walk with pride. We are the girls who are changing history. We are the girls who demand equality. We say no, we have the courage to go. We save our lives, we are changing our tribe. We are educated women and you walk with pride. The first step is the hardest. You love your family, you love your mom. But one day, someone tells you that time has come. I was nine. I was 12. I was almost 14. We saw our friends get married off. We knew the routine. My uncle told me, girl, you better run away. Tomorrow at dawn is your circumcision day. For me, it was a preacher. He said, go while you can, or your daddy gonna sell you to that 40 years old man. My dad was a poor man. He couldn't feed the kids. He needed my dowry, but I ran and hid. My teacher told me that I was smart and good in school, but my father wouldn't let me go. He said that was the rule. School is for boys, they say. Class has no choice, they say. You have to be cut, they say. You must shut up, they say. You, you have, have to be married. There is no sense wishing. It's the only way to be a good, clean Christian. But the preacher said, no, your parents just haven't heard that female circumcision is not part of God's word. You don't need a car to have a good life. A girl who has been must say no to the night. To be a real woman and a good Christian too. Get an education and yourself be true. My mama said, when you finish your chores today, don't come back home. Take this money, run away. My uncle gave some shillings to a person with a car who took me to the safe house. The journey was so far. The preacher took me to a man with a truck. The roads were so bad, we almost got stuck. I walked by myself. It was cold. The road was steep. I hid in the bushes and tried to go to sleep. An older boy took me on the back of his bike. It was raining. It was dark. There were ironers in the night. I was scared. I was strong. I was weak in my knees. I was shaking and breathless. But I had to believe. We made it to the safe house. And Mama welcomed us. We got showers and clean clothes. And all the showed me where to shower and where to eat. She gave me some clothes and showed me where to sleep. I started in class five, but now I'm in form three. I started in class two. It was hard to learn to read. I am the best in my class at science and at math. I am the head girl in my dorm and help the others do their tasks. Someday I'll go to college. Then I'll be a nurse. Then I'll be a poet and write my feelings into verse. I want to be a teacher, be a doctor, own a show. I want to be an activist and make the violence stop. Mama Agnes teaches us that our bodies are our own. And our dreams can become like seeds to be sown. In a good side of our lives, if we work hard and try, and become important people, then the limit is the sky. My parents were so angry, but now we are reconciled. They come to me for advice. They are proud that 
time they are tired. Sometimes I miss my mama, but I know she's proud of me. She works so hard with all the kids. She wants me to be free. You two can do it. You are beautiful and smart. You have love in your mind and love in your heart. So don't let people tell you you are mad or you are dumb. Be ready for the moment when you know your time has come. If I had the courage to save my own life, you too can do it. Don't get sold to be a wife. I am a powerful person and I will choose the man that I love. He will respect me and we will get married by the grace of God above. The first step can be scary, but God is on your side. Soon you'll be a smart lady and you'll walk with pride. You'll go to college, get a job and save other girls. Help you help your parents, have a family and change the world. We are the girls who are changing history. We are the girls who demand equality. All over the world, girls are claiming their power. Will you join us? Make a difference. This is the hour. One million rising. One million rising. One million rising. So that's in their words, uh, how they got to the safe house. And some of the students that are in that video are now in college. And I'm, I'm so, it's so sweet to see the ones that are coming into college this year. Um, so I just wanna give you a little background. I'm not gonna speak for a long time about the SHE Fund, but I wanna give you a little background. Um, the Safe House was created by a uh, Maasai visionary and activist named Agnes Pereo in combination with V-Day, uh, the worldwide initiative to stop violence against women and girls that was started by Eve Ensler. And um, the Safe House protects and educates girls until they graduate high school. But at that point, the law does not protect the girls anymore and the safe house is not allowed to keep them there. And so they're, they've basically been on their own. The safe house began in 2001. So there were not too many generations of girls who graduated high school, but those girls, uh, because there was no organization to see them going forward, they, many of them, simply had to go back to their villages. And although they were empowered and they were the most educated people for miles around, they um, couldn't uh, make anything of their lives other than to follow in their mother's and grandmother's footsteps and become a wife and have many children and take care of their husbands. Um, in 2000 and I think it was 2009, I got an email from this young woman and you'll see her in 2009. She's, if you've read my book, she's the one that stood in front of me at the end of the book and said, um, do, you know, do you know any songs? And she's the one who said, Mary Oliver, which was the poem that I recited to them, was a, a poem called The Journey by Mary Oliver. She said, Mary Oliver, after she heard it, is she Maasai? Um, and thanks to Marie Howe, really, when I told her that poem, she said, that's the end of your book. I never would have thought to put it in the book. But it really is, to me, the most important story in the book is that I could recite a poem by a white woman from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, USA, 
um, and Jacinta could think that she was a Maasai woman. And many of the girls thought that Mary Oliver had written the poem just for them. So Jacinta wrote me and she said, I didn't get good enough grades to get a scholarship and I don't know what to do because if I go home, I'll just have to get married. And I don't wanna do that, I wanna to go to college. So I asked a few of my friends, they all chipped in, we raised $2,000. And that $2,000 saw Jacinta through her first year of school. I kept raising money. And then a few years later, I came to visit Jacinta. And this middle picture is me and Jacinta and Jacinta's mother who came to the city to meet me and to thank me. And you can see in her face, she'd never been in a city before. Um, it was a totally moving visit. And Jacinta, bless her heart, with the help of my friends, um, graduated with a degree, which is a, a high level. Um, and this is her at her graduation. She graduated in business. And the punchline of the story is that she now runs the She Fund in Kenya. Um, and I love her so deeply. Um, so the She Fund, uh, the, the students go to school. They are, it's important to say, they are all reconciled with their parents. Uh, by the time they come into the she fund. So we're not doing something that goes against their parents. Agnes Pereo, who is an incredibly powerful force in the universe, takes them home. There's a big reconciliation ceremony with probably a hundred people there. And the, the, there's, a, there's a, a ceremony that allows them to all apologize um, and to reunite. And so by the time they come to us, they've been reconciled and we basically obey their will. They decide what kind of schooling they want, what they want to study. And we support them to find the schools. We teach them how to open up a bank account. We teach them how to use a smartphone. We teach them how to scan a receipt. Uh, we find them places to live. And we, we meaning Jacinta and also Lena, we, they take them to school and make sure that they're settled in. They do everything a parent would do. Um, so this is just a few pictures. Mercy just graduated in nursing a couple of weeks ago. We're really proud of her. Jacqueline graduated a couple of weeks ago, pandemic be damned in social work. Here she is at the women's prison. Um, Natasha, Susan Natasha, bless her heart. I think Elia, her funder is here with, her, with us. She's studying fashion and design. And this is when she was chosen to be the queen of her school. Lena, you've already met. She is going to get a business management degree next year. And Shelvin is gonna graduate in a few months from laboratory technology. So this shows a little bit about where your donation goes. And by now you can probably sense that college in Kenya Although $3,500 is not a small amount of money for some of us, um, it isn't what we spend on our children in America. And it really looks like a good deal from here. Um, and it is, in fact, it's a, it's a very good deal because we're not just giving a student an education and living expenses and the opportunity to learn new skills, we are funding, and this is important, we're funding all the students from the safe house that we can, whatever their grades in high school were. And I don't know of any other scholarship organization that does that. The students from the safe house do not always, I mean, usually they do not get good grades in high school. And usually, usually I would say always, scholarship organizations take students to some extent based on their grades. Well, we don't because we know that these students have gone to schools that are not the best. We know they've gone during a time in their lives when their parents were shunning them and hating them. And we know that they really couldn't thrive and prosper 
in these schools, even though it's far better that they went to these schools than that they didn't go at all. So when we fund a student who does not do well in high school, we're funding a student who's gonna go back to her community and really change it deeply because we're funding the students from the poorest and the most rural communities in the Rift Valley. Um, let me see what slide I put next here. There's a few ways to participate. Um, I'm not gonna run through all of these, but a primary funder, as you can see, is uh, a commitment for a number of years because we, we like to foster relationships between the students and their primary funders. And um, we don't want the student to be dropped in the middle of her uh, schooling. Um, you can, any amount, $3, $3,000 is welcome in the general fund. You can become a monthly donor. And then I'm just gonna skip down to donate smartphones, earrings, and other gifts. Um, I bring, I ask people to donate your discarded smartphones, iPads, tablets, Androids, iPhones. And then we can, I, I put new batteries in them. And I take them to Kenya and there are so many people, not just our students, but their little sisters who can use the tablet to start learning English, even though they're out in the midst of um, the bush uh, without electricity, they do have solar and they do have network out there. And so I've received a bunch of requests to bring tablets for the little sisters and little brothers of the students so that they can begin learning also. Um, so if you want to do that, please contact us if you have one of these devices hanging around your house. We welcome air miles, we welcome volunteering, um, we welcome just about anything. And um, I'll just stop speaking with this, this slide um, which is a miraculous moment. I don't know if Maureen is still on the call, but Maureen was Regina's funder. Regina graduated in 2019 and a group of us, a group of funders and myself and Annie Lightbody, we all went to Regina's home um, where they had this gathering of probably a hundred villagers and to celebrate Regina's graduation. And also to thank us, we had no idea this was going to happen, but I find this, this image completely um, heart opening and heartbreaking because you have Regina in the middle and every one of these women, her, her I think it's her mother who's right, the short lady next to her and her sisters and sister-in-law and, and the friends and the villagers, every one of those women was married off when she was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and she was cut. And they and the whole village committed during the ceremony that they wouldn't cut their daughters anymore and that they would send their daughters to college because of what Regina was able to do. So we thank you. We're so glad to have you with us. And uh, I am gonna stop this screen share and um, I think you can still unmute yourself, can you? Yes, you can. But first, before I invite you all to share, I want I see Patty's here. And uh, also I wanna invite Maya and Nicola. I don't know if Annie's here. Any of the staff or board that are here, um, I'd like to invite you to add a few words to what I've said, if you'd like to. I will. Great. Go, Patty. I knew you would. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I am I feel like it's such a privilege to be part of this. Um, I'm a primary funder and I'm on the board. And when I first heard about the She Fund, somehow in my mind, I, I thought I had to kind of qualify to donate to be a part of it because it's Kim has created such a sacred container and space where you you saw how they're cared for. I was on that trip in 2019 
And to meet these girls and to be a part of their life is life-changing. It's, it's a gift. Like, I feel like I've got the gift here. Um, and to have their, and then the she fund holds their hand um, through college, how to, how to get around, how to go through and navigate the world. I mean, what you saw is how they live, you know, no electricity and, you know, what other organization does all of that? And then, and as a primary funder, you can have a relationship with this girl, which I talked to my, to Nelly, we do it on Zoom, I not Zoom, um, what is it? Anyway. WhatsApp. WhatsApp, WhatsApp. So we're, we talk on WhatsApp, we do some texting and, and it's, it's, to me, it's such a gift. Like I thought, wait, you know, I was, I heard about it. I was just walking with a friend. No one was trying to get me to do anything. And then I, 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 I made up my mind instantly that I want to do this. And I went home, looked it up, said, you know, where can I send a check? And I didn't hear from anybody. And then I realized like, oh, this is really a one-on-one -on -one beautiful container that is precious and sacred for these girls. I mean, you, you could obviously write a check and you could donate right now. But for me, I thought, God, I don't know any other, I don't know anything like this. And so not only do we have such a big impact on this one girl's life, she goes back to her community and the father says, you know, I want to do this with my younger daughters. Um, they, they are looked upon as, you know, somebody that they can, the, the rest of the community and the elders can ask questions of and, you know, and then, and then these empowered girls, like they're out there, like those, those, uh, that video and the song, I mean, it's all real. And it was so cool to like, um, recognize so many of the faces and they're just, I mean, so pure and simple, simple, meaning the love is so simple. There's no agenda. There's no complication. It's just pure love. And anyway, I, I hope everybody has an opportunity to impact that way. Um, and then, and then, so like, it's the ripple effect and where the community goes, we don't have to do this. We, there are other ways. And the, and the girl goes through college. She goes back to the community. She builds her mother a house and she's a stand for, for women, for girls, for equality. And as of 2016, it's illegal, even though it still happens, but that Agnes Pareo had that happen. So think about like how $1 can change the world because it's so hard to believe like, oh, you write a check to some organization, like how much is it is really going there? What can my money actually do? And, and then here you, you actually see it in, you know, real time. So anyway, I, do you think I'm excited about this? Um, <laughs> a little bit. So now I'm, on the, uh, I'm funding a girl and you know, what a gift. Like, I feel like, uh, thank you for letting me qualify to do this. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you are so qualified and you're such a gift, Patty. And your energy also is, is fuel, is wind in our sails also. Um, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim, what you did, what you created here. That's what you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if Elia would like to talk about your relationship with Susan Natasha. I, I'm putting you on the spot. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Gosh, I feel like after Patty, there's like very little else I can say. <laughs> so thank you, Patty. Um, I have, um, you know, I first met um, Kim through um, poetry and writing poetry um, and actually through Ellen Bass initially and doing a workshop with Ellen and Kim. And then as I got to know Kim, I just knew I needed to do her programs and got involved with the Poetry Depths Mystery School. And then Kim started talking about the She Fund and I thought, this is something I wanna support and decided to have a fundraiser at our home in Los Angeles. And it was just amazing. And I thought I need to sponsor a girl. And um, when I got, when Kim put me together with Susan Natasha, I could just see right away what a huge part she had and the way she calls me mom on our WhatsApp messages and asks about her brother and sister, which are my kids and how they're doing and asks about her other daddy, which is my husband and our cat. And it's just so wonderful to hear how she's doing in school. And she has so loved 
her fashion and design program and to see her making her own clothes and then bringing those talents home and sharing that with her family. And even during the pandemic to get to see her family for the first time and see pictures of them and videos of them. And she was so happy because for her birthday, her father gave her a goat, which then had triplets. So now she has four goats and seeing a little video of the goats and her on the farm. And it's just, it feels so personal. It's so different than the other charitable giving that I've done where everything feels like I'm just giving to this organization or maybe this group of people, but the way that she's been set up as a primary donor, you really feel such an attachment to the girl that you're supporting. Um, and there's just nothing like that that I've experienced. Um, so I feel really grateful and having a chance to be on the board as well and know that I'm doing whatever I can to help the whole organization is just so moving, especially in the context of this. Mm. I've had a couple of folks ask for the current donation amount, the total amount. And we, my friends, have collectively raised $25,600, um, almost $10,000 just in today's event. So mm. um, we've, Kim, Nicola, and I have a little chat going where we've been able to connect about technical <laughs> difficulties and things. And we've been just overjoyed and celebrating with one another about how much generosity has been on display. And yes, I'm seeing in the chat more in the mail. It's true. We've had some folks want to donate by check. So that number is probably going to keep growing for a little while. And the link to donate will still be active for the days to come. So those who would like to donate more or donate for the first time, you will still be able to do so. Um, and we just have endless, endless, endless gratitude to you and for, mm -hmm. for the lives that you're changing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I take your hands. I offer you, I feel such support. I feel, I feel like this has been life-changing for me. Um, and I know it'll be life-changing for the she students.